today. It is part of my Buying Without Banks subgroup meeting that I hold once a month here in Dayton. And we have guest speakers, Kurt and Elizabeth Phillips from Lancaster, Ohio, speaking at this meeting, going through the exact steps to follow to raise money from private lenders. I know you're going to get a ton of information. I took over a page of notes from this meeting and I know you'll benefit. So enjoy. So, so when coming to, especially when it comes to private money, I mean, this is one of the huge topics uh, that we talk about, and it's probably one of the main questions we get, in, that and creative financing, um, because uh, it's a real, you know, possibility that I know for us, uh, as we were getting into real estate, we didn't have unlimited funds. Uh, we didn't have just all this piles of money sitting around thinking, well, we're just going to get conventional financing and put, you know, our 20, 25 percent down on properties. It just wasn't the reality where we're at. So we had to figure out something which as we, we coach folks and talk to folks and run our meetup, we find that that's pretty much everybody. I mean, most of us are in that scenario. And so I'm going to share a lot about how we use private money and how we've grown our portfolio using private money. So, but it can be used a lot of different ways. I mean, uh, if you talk to somebody like uh, An An Antoine, I think it was, or I don't know if I pronounced your name right or not, you're not up on my screen, but uh, he, has, yeah. he has like 200 units, does a lot of things creatively. He might utilize creative uh, or uh, private money a little bit differently than maybe we do, uh, or somebody who's flipping. Uh, predominantly, which we flip, might use it differently. So there's lots of, it's very versatile is my point. So I'm going to share some of the strategies that we use. And, uh, and then we'll just kind of go from there and take Q&A along the way. So so it's really when it comes to, to anything really, but especially it, with private money, it's really the unknown that holds us back. Uh, and it might be questions to like, what kind of paperwork do I need? Uh, who and how to contact, like, who do I contact and how do I talk to them? Uh, maybe that's not you, but that was totally me. Uh, I, I'm not a big phone person and, uh, you know, I'm not the outgoing guy that wants to talk to people on the phone and it, I'm just not that type of person. That might be you as well. Uh, you might get nervous when you're talking and asking for money. Uh, what should be in my credibility kit? What the heck even is a credibility kit? Uh, that might be one of your questions. I have someone who has an IRA or wants to lend or, and it's not self-directed. What do I do? So just all of these questions, but really I think what it comes down to is we, I, I have to ask myself this question is why was I paralyzed with fear? And there's a saying that, that knowledge is power, but knowledge with action attached to it is really power. It's knowledge applied. And so my hope is to give you some knowledge that you can apply right away so that you can get started in this journey so that on your next deal, you can raise private money. I'm going to talk really fast through this, guys, because I want to get to the nuts and bolts. I don't want to run out of time. So my background, real quick, Elizabeth and I, we, it all started when we bought this beauty right here. Uh, oh. This duplex in Lancaster, she ran by it. Our pastor actually said that he and his wife owned a duplex, and they rented out one side, and it paid for their expenses. Wouldn't that be great? And so we thought, well, he's a pretty smart guy. Let's go ahead and buy a rental. And so we did. Uh, we were in our early 20s and it, we, we lived in the right hand side of this. And then the left hand side taught me a lot about being landlord. It's amazing when you live in the same building with your tenants. Uh, we did everything wrong. Uh, I, I, at one point, they were three months behind rent. And this quick story, this is how, just to give you oh, hope, no. quick oh, story no. that I was trying to collect rent from these folks. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you can't see me, but I'm like, like Rudy Rudiger, I'm five foot nothing, a hundred and nothing. This guy that lived there was like this big honk and massive dude. Like you could tell he worked out. Right. Well, when I would go over, <laughs> this happened more than once. I'd go over to knock on his door and ask for rent, which don't do that, by the way, like what not dumb idea, do. but we did it back then. We'd knock on his door cause he was late on rent and I don't know if he like stripped down to his tidy whities on purpose or if he just walked around like this, but he would literally answer the door, walk out the storm door. He wouldn't just stand in his 
white whiteies on the front door. and asked me what I needed. And I'd say, uh, yeah, it's uh, you're a little late on rent. Uh, can you pay rent? And he's like, yeah, I'll get on that. I'm like, okay, thanks. And then I <laughs> turn around and walk away, you know, but uh, that was my first experience of being a landlord. So if uh, you're not perfect at this, don't worry. We all have stories to tell. I had been at UPS for 12 years after we bought that, we bought that duplex, we realized real estate might make sense because it's really nice getting a check when, like when you actually figure it out and they start paying. Uh, it's nice to get a check in the mail and it pays for your mortgage and all this stuff. And we thought, man, maybe this could be the vehicle for us because I worked at UPS for 12 years. I was a driver for nine and a half of those years. And it wasn't that I hated being a UPS driver or I hated the job. I really didn't mind it. It was actually, I enjoyed a lot of parts of it, but it was kind of like for me wearing somebody else's shoes. Like it just didn't fit what we wanted to do with our family and with our time. And so maybe that's you. Maybe you're in a job that you don't really mind, but you want to be able to live life on your own terms. Uh, or maybe maybe you hate your job and you really just want out of it. Um, either way, uh, we were in a position, I was getting home at about 7.30 every night and it just, it wasn't okay. This, uh, this picture here, you can see my, my little guy here, my little four-year-old at the time or three-year-old, he's really into the moment, he's yawning and like whatever. This is the, my last day at UPS. Uh, we were able to accomplish an extraordinary goal that was uh, amazing for our family. And uh, my kids actually turned in those uniforms they turned around right after this picture and trumped in there and handed them to my supervisor. Uh, or actually, I set them at his feet. So that was pretty cool. Um, that was four and a half years ago. And uh, I haven't been back. They've asked me to come back, but I'm not doing it. So I'm going to stroll through these real quick because um, there is kind of this feeling that uh the goal of getting out of our jobs or becoming financially free or having some sense of autonomy can almost seem daunting can almost seem like it's it's out of reach and what i found uh, what kind of we found is that and what we were taught is uh, that it's either the dream or the dread that drives us now i we hear a lot about this guys if you read a lot or you go to a lot of these i understand uh, a lot of speakers talk about this so let me just share my perspective quickly and we'll roll on here and hopefully this will, this will help you i had a mentor that asked me two questions he said what do you want out of life that you feel like you're not on track to get and that was kind of a kick in the gut for me because i had a lot of things in my life that i wasn't on track to get uh and really it was <laughs> offensive the question was offensive to me <laughs> and then uh the other question is if time and money were no object uh what would you what would you change uh, what would change about your life and what that did is it began to get me just thinking about what options I wanted in my life. But this is just, so this is, this is not across the board, but what I found is for me, and, and this seems to be, I might be out of line saying this, but it seems to be kind of a male thing predominantly, I, I, not all the time. Okay. But for me, it wasn't so much the dream that would drive me to call a private lender or to, take a risk or to take a chance on, you know, what seemed like a chance on buying a property, which really wasn't as risky as I thought. It was the dread. It was, if this doesn't work, what else am I going to do? Like, what are my options here? You know, especially after I left my job, I thought, man, is this the dumbest thing I have ever done? And uh, so something needed to give. And my wife, for example, she was more of the dream of having me home, the dream of having our family together. And that's what drove her. So find what it is for you and basically just dance all over it. If it's your dread, if it's your dream, whatever it is, just keep it in front of you. And one of the most important things you can do is invest in yourself. These are just some of the books uh, along the way that, uh, and we're recording this, so you can always go back and check this out. These are some of the books that we've read uh, along the way that have helped us. Uh, the beautiful thing about reading and listening on Audible now is that uh, whatever knowledge you put in your head uh, can't be taken away from you. So you could, you could lose it all as far as finances, but as long as you got the knowledge, having the power uh, in your, within yourself to make it back is totally freeing and liberating. So, so why private money? Basically, uh, private money for us we were at a dead end in our real estate career. We were out of options, 
had very little money. Some of you might say, wow, this sounds way familiar. Um, <laughs> had very little money. And I hadn't pocketed the proverbial eight. And what I mean by that is I knew that I wasn't free yet. When we left UPS, we had some serious setbacks financially that we didn't expect. And so we really had to figure this out or else I was job hunting. Uh, so you can imagine the sense of desperation. And so whatever it is for you, that eight ball, what private money can do in creative financing as a whole, but tonight we'll talk about private money. What it does is whatever that eight ball is, that's leaving your job. If it's retiring and leaving a legacy or, uh, or whatever it is, taking care of aging parent, whatever that is, that eight ball, that's what private money enables you to do because you can go way faster using private money than you can just by yourself. And honestly, it's more fun. Okay, this is my disclaimer. I'm not an accountant. I'm not an attorney. You probably figured that out by now, just by the way I talk. So uh, yeah, there you go. This is not legal advice. I'm not telling you what property to buy or not to buy or what to do. So boom, there we go. All right, quickly, what is private money? So they're typically asset based. Let's see if I can squeeze this down. There we go. So they're typ typically asset based, uh, backed by a, a real estate is what we're going to talk about tonight. Now you can have, you can use it in a lot of different ways. Okay. But we're talking about a uh, private money that has an asset of real estate back to it. And this is based off of mainly the financial credentials of the borrower or the deal itself. Now the lender could be just about anyone. They could be a friend, a family member, whoever. Uh, and the beautiful thing real quick about private money is that it's more flexible and it's usually cheaper than other kinds of money. So for example, uh, if you were to go to a bank, uh, obviously a lot of us know that if you go to the bank, they're going to ask for your, you know, three years of tax returns. They're going to ask for your financial statement. They're going to ask for, you, you know, your firstborn, all this stuff they're asking for. Um, when you have a private money lender, it's based off of relationship, mostly relationship. And then it can be based off of the deal itself. Uh, so the terms can vary, uh, the, the interest rates, the, the limits on the lending, the, the duration, everything is open for discussion when you're dealing with a private money lender. And that's one of the things that makes it so attractive is that you can negotiate all of these things because it is based off of relationship. When you walk into a bank, the banker might act like they love you and it's based off a of relationship. But I can tell you that when you leave your job and you walk into that banker, they will no longer know your name. They said to me, Mr. Phillips, I don't know who you are. I'm sorry. I know we did three deals together, but since you left UPS, I got nothing for you. So uh, that's a hollow feeling, by the way, when you're not expecting it. Uh, so private money also brings with it unlimited funding. Uh, and it's funny, there's kind of a pendulum that swings uh, where it, it seems like as you raise private money, sometimes you have more money than deals. Other times you have more deals than money. And it, and it kind of goes that way. Typically, uh, I've talked to a lot of folks that are in this scenario right now that are looking for deals. Everybody's looking for deals and they've got some funding and some lenders that are saying, hey, bring me a deal. You know, you've, you've refinanced out my loan, bring me a deal. But uh, if you have unlimited funding, then it really is inspirational to you're inspired to go find like the next deal because you know you have the funds for it and if you know you have the funds for it the lid is lifted even mentally uh and i'm sure you guys have all experienced it where you're wanting to deal and wanting to deal but you're so concerned that you don't have the funding for the deal that you don't chase it down maybe don't pursue it i know i've been in the, that position where i didn't pursue a deal because i wasn't sure if i had the funding lined up and so i didn't do it and then i watched somebody else buy it you know and i think oh, i buy that deal well if you do the work now to raise the funding that won't be a problem and you can purchase the property with a hundred percent financing the private money loan will cover the entire cost it can cover the entire cost and it can be no money down where you don't bring any of your cash to the table 
So I'm going to get into some specifics here. Is there any questions or anything right now? I'm going to keep rolling here. If so, just uh, speak up and well, if you raise it, I won't be able to see it. You, yeah, you can put it in the chat or you can interrupt me either way. It's fine. So hard money versus private money. This is pretty important uh, because this is a distinction that I didn't totally understand when I first got started. And I find that a lot of folks are in the same boat. Private money is fast and easy access. You can typically close a deal within 10 days or less using a private lender. Uh, they'll typically fund, or they can, excuse me, they can fund the entire deal. And we'll get into why that can be the case here in a minute. And it's low cost. You're not going to, you're not going to have to pay points on a private money loan. Um, the interest rates will be reasonable. Uh, in a lot of ways you can set the interest rates with your lender with a hard money lender. That is not an option. Um, there's a lot of paperwork. There's a process, a hard money lender. Just keep in mind, the difference, the main difference is the hard money lender is a professional lender. This is what they do. There's nothing, they have, there's a place for that, okay? There's totally a place for that, especially if you're maybe a flipper rehabber and you need to get this deal done and you don't have any private money. Hard money will a lot of times will work as long as there's enough meat on that bone when you go to sell it. But there's more paperwork. They typically won't lend more than 70% of the value of the property. Um, and there's higher interest rates. Uh, my litmus test usually is, you know, when you get to 12% and up, you're starting to get to hard money. Uh, they're, they're, they're typically going to charge a point or two on the front end, which is a percentage point of the purchase price. So it's just more expensive. But again, there's a place for it. Uh, it's not quite as fast, but it still can be a fast closing with a hard money lender. So just an important distinction that I wanted to cover. We have somebody we need to admit. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'm going to jump into a property that I'm actually working on right now. Um, so I wanted to go through this kind of a step by step because that's kind of how my brain works. So I said, I hope this will help you, especially if you're new to working with private money. So this house just came onto my lap. Um, it's not even under contract yet. So I'm not, I'm not telling you where it's at. Forget about it. I don't think you can read the address. I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, uh, it was actually contacted by the seller because he contacted a realtor friend and the realtor friend said, yeah, I don't know. You might need to contact Kurt and Elizabeth. They special specialize in these kind of properties. So you know what kind of it's property a, I'm walking into. Property. Yeah. yeah, you know, but uh, you know what? It smelled like money. So, oh. so we got into this thing and now the work begins. It is better to know who you're gonna call to raise money before you get the deal under contract. But if you're really courageous and you like want to jump out of the plane and kind of put together your parachute on the way down and that's your personality, then go ahead and get it under contract and then try and raise the money. Uh, just make sure you know what your exit strategies are. So first step, make a list of potential lenders. Do this now. This is like action step number one. It's something you can do before you go to bed tonight. You can do it tomorrow. If you do nothing else tonight, any of the action steps I give you, do this one. Keep it simple. Get a Google sheet. Write out friends that you know of. It, it, and, and guys, sometimes uh, I hear folks say, write down any doctors, attorneys, high incomers. Yes, write those people down. I can tell you personally, I grew up pouring concrete and driving a UPS truck. I didn't have a lot of doctors and attorneys in my like close knit circle. Like I had a lot of blue collar guys that were workers that that's who was in my circle. And I can tell you, I've had no problem raising private money. So don't be discouraged if you don't know a lot of those quote unquote high income earners as friends. Just write folks down that you think would be open. Family, write them down, it's okay. Uh, some folks say never partner with family, private money is a little bit different, but one person says, don't do it. I say, it's okay. It's okay. Write down some family members in that list. Next is other investors. And the reason I put first in that other investors, because if you've never done a deal before and you're walking into your first deal, or even maybe just a second deal, but you've never raised money for it before. 
other investors understand the game, that's going to be an easier phone call to make than trying to sell your friend who knows you as your as his fraternity brother that used to bong, you know, beer in the at parties at frat parties. Like, you know, he's going to you're doing what? You know, you want how much? Uh, so you might have to have some uh, somewhat of a track record with them. But other investors, if you're, for example, in this meetup right here, I guarantee you, I, I guess I won't guarantee, but I bet you, I bet you there's folks here that will probably be willing to lend money on a good deal to get a good return. I bet you. So network like crazy, keep coming to these things. Obviously, as other networking events begin to open up, making a priority in your calendar to attend those things because investors are way easier to approach for your early on deals. I know that my first two deals with, were with other investors uh, and that helped me tremendously because they already understood the game. They get return on investment. So the second one is your urea, which is actually in conjunction with other investors, which is what you're doing right now. So write down folks, you know, write down the people on this call. <laughs> there you go. Events, online, referrals, bankers. Yes, even bankers. I had a banker actually refer a lender to me. Uh, and I've always remembered that banker because not many of them will do it. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out back, go to my list actually. And I already did. I actually already contacted uh, a guy that has lent to me on several deals. He's a firefighter um, and he loves real estate, but he's a little nervous about investing in real estate, but he's okay in being a lender. So if you're going step by step, you got a house, you're interested in it, you're going to try and negotiate it, get it under contract. This is your first step. Make your list or check your list, one or the other. So I checked my list. All right, next up, you want to write out your terms. You want to be prepared. What I mean by your terms is what are you going to do for an interest rate? You generally want to walk in with a thought in mind. Um, you don't want to... Uh, sit on a uh, be on a conversation with an investor and uh you know have to figure it out on the fly uh you know if you're not prepared for this then they're gonna throw out a high number <laughs> just know it's gonna happen they're gonna say yeah 12 percent. i'll give you 12 percent loan so know your range know what you want to do um really what i would suggest is if you're going to talk to an investor you got to make it worth their while if you're going to talk to somebody who is not typically an investor like a friend or a family member or something like them you know, if you're going to give them 6%, they're going to love 6%. For an investor, they'll probably want to be upwards to 8 to 10%. It's just the reality of it. I know I would be. Uh, I would, anything less than 10%, I, I personally wouldn't consider. So know your range and know who you're talking to, what you want to do. And guys, does anybody have any questions? I'm, I know I'm flying through this. Anybody have any questions so far? All right, know how you want to structure it as well whether you want to have that money accrue or whether you want to pay monthly interest only payments uh, on buy and hold. What we typically do is we do monthly interest only payments to our buy and hold uh, on our buy and hold properties. Whereas if we're going to flip a property, we like to let it accrue. And the reason we want to let that accrue is because we're already putting money into the property. We're already going to be rehabbing it. We've got holding costs. We've got contractors coming in and out. We're paying a lot of bills. There's a lot of money flowing in and out of that property. Well, there's not much flowing back at us, but there's a lot of money flowing out of that property in a flip uh, in the beginning. And so the last thing you want to do is to have to make payments to your private lender on top of all of that. So we typically structure it so that our private lender gets paid when we sell the house. Uh, and that's how I would recommend it because I think that really helps the whole process. Whereas if you've got a buy and hold investment, um, one thing you can do is if you've got a huge rehab and you know that property is going to be sitting empty for a couple of months, you can actually let that accrue for the first you know, 60 days. You can ask your lender, hey, can we let that accrue for the first 60 days so that I can get this thing uh, have put residents in these properties and to get a rehab and then we'll pay you that lump sum at the end of 60 days and then we'll continue the monthly payments. So that's something you can do too. A lot of different options guys on this. We have a minimum someone will invest with you. So if you call someone, one of the, one of the rules I have is that anytime I call someone, I never tell them no. This is one of my rules. If they say 12%, I don't tell them no. I just say, well, I'm not sure the numbers on this deal will work for 12%. But if I find anything that does, I'll definitely give you a call. 
Okay, so just don't say no. <laughs> uh, I had somebody that actually got offended because uh, an investor said 12% and they told them off. I'm like, oh, what was their, what was their name and number? I'll call them. So will you have a minimum? And what I mean by that is, uh, are you gonna have, if somebody says, well, I don't have, if you're trying to raise money. So for this house right here, this is probably gonna be about a $65,000 house. You, you that green, beautiful house that you saw. I'm guessing it'll probably be around there. We're still in negotiations, but we're close enough that I, I think it'll get done. Um, and so I'm looking for the full 65. So if I called somebody and they say, well, I can do 30. Well, you know, I might consider that, but really I'm looking for the 65. So you have to know what your minimum amount is. So now you have somebody that says they can invest 30,000. So write them down on your Google sheet, put down 30,000 minimum. If somebody says 10,000, say, okay, well, now I know somebody who will lend 10,000. Uh, basically for me, there's not really a minimum. I'm going to say, man, that's awesome. I really appreciate you being willing to entrust me with $5,000 to loan. Now, I don't know where you're going to use $5,000, but it doesn't matter because usually there's more than 5,000. Kind of a rule of thumb is if they say 30, they probably have 60. If they have 100, they might have 200. Like it just seems to go that way. And when they get confidence in your abilities to get the deals done, then they'll open up that extra money. So write them down, thank them. Even if they won't land on all the deal and you really need it, don't sweat it. Make sure you thank them. I, a lot of times I, I coach this to my clients to say, if somebody's willing to lend you money on a deal, but you just, it's not enough to make it work or it's too high of an interest rate, send them a thank you card. All right. Send them a thank you card, just thanking them for being willing and offering that to you. Uh, that builds a ton of credibility. So just a, and also when you, to be a private lender, especially also send them a thank you card. So how, what is the LTV you want to encumber the property with? This is a loan to value. Uh, this is where we're talking with that hard money that they typically won't lend you more than 70%, 75% in some cases, if they really like you. Um, here, know how much you want to encumber this property. My recommendation is you don't go too far over that 70% mark because you really got to be comfortable in your numbers. I'm going to go uh, over a deal real quick where I screwed this up uh, because uh, usually when when you're speaking, you want to go over your highlight reel, uh, but, but I'm going to make sure and go through one that I totally screwed up early on. So, uh, but know your LTV, know, know what you want to do, know what banks you have available. What, what are they going to refinance you out at? Um, are they going to, are they going to refinance at 80% of LTV of your loan to value? If they're going to do 80%, then how close are you comfortable getting to that with your private lender, knowing how much your rehab costs? And this is a whole nother topic guys. So know how to do your numbers. I know Chad and, and Sham and all these folks will are, that'll be on here eventually if it hasn't already of how to run numbers on properties and figure out that rehab stuff. So that's another topic, but when you're utilizing private money, if you screw that up, make sure you got a reserve but really got to nail that, nail that, that rehab cost. What if the lender needs their money back? This happens. This happened to us one time. Uh, fortunately, we were, the properties were done. They were rehabbed and rented out and it wasn't a big deal. Uh, but know that this can happen. If a lender says they need their money back, um, usually you want to put a, a, a something in your, in your note that says how much gives you a certain amount of time, gives you 45 days, for example, to cash them out. So they're just going to have to work with you. Don't freak out if that happens or if that's happening, it's ever happened to you. Don't freak out. It's not the end of the world. There's ways to, ways around that. So let's see, I got to admit somebody here. Okay. All right, here we go. So backing up real quick here. So what have we done so far? We've made our list. All right. So we've got this house. We're getting ready to get in our contract. We've made our list. We've written out our terms. We got to have those terms because now we're going to get on the phone. This is the scary part. This is the part that takes courage. Get on the phone. Do not just spam your list with emails. Please, for crying out loud, don't do it. I've gotten those emails and I'm like, don't email. All right. Only email somebody if they've done a lot of deals with you. Even then, I still, I still call them. But make the phone call real quick script for you use any variation of this. Okay. Uh, I'm usually on the fly when I talk on the phone, but I almost always started out the same way. Hey, George, how's it going? I'm actually calling to talk business. Is this a good time to chat? Just go there. Like 
don't start talking about, hey, how are the kids? How's Lucy? How, I can assume that'd be his wife. You know, how's whatever, like how's work? Don't eat, just tell him, hey, I'm actually calling talk business. It's a good time to chat. As far as men are concerned, a guy's going to say, yeah, what you got? Like, all right, for ladies, again, this isn't across the board. For ladies, you might want to say, hey, Lucy, how are you? Hey, I'm actually calling for a specific reason. But before we get to that, how are the kids? How's yeah. this? Like, it's okay. It's true. <laughs> it's okay. So, so it's okay to we do like that. We like it that way. But just state that you have a purpose for calling first. Because the last thing you want to do is talk to them for 20 minutes and say, oh, uh, by the way, and then bring up that you want to borrow money for a deal. So just a little tip there. So tell the story about the deal. Uh, don't go into a ton of detail, but I tell you, everybody loves a good story. Tell them how you came across it. Tell them about the house a little bit. Don't go on for 20 minutes about it. Just give them a few snapshot things of, uh, of what you can do. Uh, okay, sorry. I, we got so just give them a, a little snapshot of what's going on with the property and how you got it. Everybody loves a story, okay? And you like to tell it because you're excited about it. And honestly, enthusiasm is a big deal. Uh, because you may be scared to death, but you don't want to know it. <laughs> Make a call. So then it's the, then it's the then just let them know why you're calling. It, this isn't the pitch. If you want to call it that, you can. But this is just why you're calling. So I'm looking for someone that would want to lend on this deal. Uh, after you just told them about it, you've shared it with them, so they're not going to be taken off guard. I'm asking for so in this deal, I'd say I'm asking for sixty-five thousand, which I suspect will be the purchase price. It'd be right around there. So I'd probably say seventy thousand actually, just to give myself some wiggle room. I'm asking for 70,000. I can give up the 10% return, which would be, I don't know, a 500 and some dollar monthly payment, 580 or something like that monthly payment. Throw that in there. So I would pay you $580 a month. That's really important uh, because they see 70,000 and they see 10%. And if they're not investor savvy, they don't know what that means. So know what your monthly amount is and wondered if there's, that's something you'd be interested in. We had one of our clients that just closed his first deal and it was a private money deal. And he made a lot of these phone calls and he crushed it. But he, uh, what he did is he built his list. He built his list. He got a lot of no's, but almost everybody was interested. They just wanted to see if he was going to close this first deal. So can you do this? <laughs> yes. Yes. You can do this. Okay. You can make the call. You can put this together. What paperwork do I need? All right. You've done the hard work. Sometimes we uh, get what an a, a paralysis by analysis that we think we can't do this because we don't know what documentation we need. This all comes back to what your desire is, what the outcome you want to be in your real estate portfolio, what the goal is. Paperwork is not a big deal, guys. This is not a big deal. So if you're you know, really melancholy and everything's got to have an answer and the nuts and bolts are everything. And if you don't have it lined up, you kind of freak out. Know that this is like the easiest part. And I mean that. So before I get into this, you steer the ship on this. So don't leave this to your lender to get the paperwork ready. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. You got to steer every ship. But what's the saying? If you didn't see it happen, it didn't happen. And this, <laughs> and this goes for everything across the board this is you know you get the deal on a contract you're going to open title with a title company all right you can ask probably any of the experienced investors on here that have done deals and they'll direct you to a title company that they use because typically as investors we have a couple that we all really like and we we use this in our area anyway in dayton there's way more than in lancaster but here we have like 10 to choose from you know uh if that so, so you open title with a title company. Again, their job is to close the deal and distribute funds. I've had title companies not distribute the funds at the end of a private money deal. Oh. Literally, my private lender called me and said, hey, did you close that deal? This is the worst phone call I've ever gotten. And I said, yeah, we closed it like three weeks ago. And he said, then where's my money? Bad day. Fortunately, he's one of my best friends and it all turned out good. I didn't realize the title company hadn't released the funds. So there you go. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had that happen. I talked to a lot of people that are like, I've never heard of that happening. Yeah, me neither. 
we got our next three closings for free. They did give us that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so if you didn't see it happen, it didn't happen. Next, contact a real estate attorney. Again, on this call, I guarantee you these good folks know real estate attorneys for you to call to get this paperwork lined up. It's not a big deal. Just about any real estate attorney worth their weight in anything knows what is needed. But go with the referrals from this group. Uh, I'm sure that they'll help you out. Uh, here's the documents you're going to need for most transactions. Not all, most simple private money transactions. You're going to need a promissory note. This is just the actual loan, the payback details, and what happens if you don't pay it back, okay? This is a simple one, two-page document. It's not that long. They're going to write this up. Mortgage. So this spells out the specifics concerning the property. Again, your attorney or an attorney that you contact has like a template on file. It's not a big deal. And then personal guarantee. This one is not required. You do not have to give a personal guarantee, but I typically do. I know guys that don't. I typically do because for me, if I'm not willing to put my name on the line, so to speak, for this property, uh, then I really have no, I don't feel confident that I should be taking this, this, this family's hard earned money as a lender for this deal. Like I'm going to personally guarantee this. Now the banks require you to personal guarantee any loans that you do. Okay. So this isn't new under the sun, but for private money loans, you don't have to offer this. And if they don't know what it is, as in your lender, then it doesn't matter. Now you're not going to default on the loan. You're going to pay it back. You're going to keep a good name and a good reputation, but I'm just saying I always offer the personal guarantee and it's super simple and it's not going to backfire on you. All right, step four. Oh, any questions so far? Hey, Kirk, you may want to mention if they have any questions they don't want to ask on the screen, they can always type it in the chat box. Yes. I'm looking, looking at the box. Yes, thank you, Sam. We're, uh, Elizabeth's actually manning the oh. box, womaning the box. Wonderful. There you go. <laughs> womaning. <He's> <laughs> <laughs> she's, That's a new word. I don't know. Gosh. Can't so she's of. taking care of the box, the message box. That's so yeah, hilarious. if you guys have any questions, then go ahead and, and put them on there and we'll see them pop up or she'll see them pop up and she'll let me well, know. Instead of calling womaning and manning, make it personing. Person isn't, isn't yeah, anyway. We're not even gonna go there. All right. Grandma so what is <laughs> <laughs> so what if it's in an IRA? I'm not gonna get into all the specifics here, guys but know that it's really not that complicated. If somebody has it in a, in an IRA, it, it hopefully is in a self-directed IRA. There's only, you know, there's only so much you can do with that. Um, but you can contact the custodians and they will let you know what documents are required. Okay. Uh, basically you got this person, they've got a self-directed IRA. They want to land in it. Then awesome. You contact the custodian. All right, whoever that is, SunWest, well, SunWest Trust, I don't know if they're around, whoever, whoever it is, you contact them and find out what documents is needed. Again, you're manning the ship. Don't leave it to your lender to contact them to figure it out. You want to make it as easy as possible, and you want to do as much of the work as you can. What typically happens with these deals is that you'll collect the paperwork, but they'll need to fit, uh, they'll need to fill in, you know, their requirement fields. So you got it, you send it to them, they got to send it in and they got to send it to the custodian. So they do have to play a role in this. They can't just do nothing, but you go ahead and direct this. And Doc Hub is a great tech tool for that. I'm sure your realtors, you guys have dot loop and different things, but we find dot hub is a really good one. Yep, doc hub rocks, it's good. And there's dot loop and there's, there's a lot of different ones. So just, just a, an idea. I have cannot hear what she's saying. Yeah. Uh, so if she could get closer to the mic when she has comments, I think it would help me a lot. Yep. Okay. Same thing here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So she was saying Doc Hub is a great uh, tool to for documents. That's Doc like C U B Cub. Uh, D D O C. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. She's gonna put it in the chat if you didn't hear that. Thank you. 
There we go. On its way. Okay. All right. How to get yourself out there. Uh, this is another way of saying how to raise money out in the world. Okay. Elevator pitch. Uh, you probably heard a lot about this. This is just telling, you know, you want to tell everybody what you do. All right. You want to tell everyone. I, one of the things that I say a lot is I own and manage rental properties. Uh, and then what I'm working on now is a new arm of my business or a new part. You know, you can word that any way you want, but that's usually how I start. I own and manage my, I own and manage rental properties and say something outside of that. Now, you know, you can say, but what I'm really excited about is then go on hit hint. Do not lead with your day job. I used to do this. <laughs> I used to say I own and manage rental properties and I work for UPS. And ultimately they would ask me, so my cousin works for UPS. Like, how do you like, and then we would go off the rails. I'm like, oh man, we're I don't want to talk about UPS. That's what I'm trying to get out of. So uh, don't lead with your day job. Just leave it out of it. Like, don't even mention it because that's where it'll probably get hung up. Uh, I like to tell people I can, you know, I can typically get folks, my investors, somewhere between a 6% return. And, you know, I'm, I'm giving you this super quickly, guys. I have my whole spiel, it, not my whole spiel. It takes me like five seconds, 10 seconds. Uh, to go through this and it's never the same it's never the same it's always different for me it's my personality but if your personality is that you like to know going into a conversation exactly what you're going to say write it down practice it rehearse it look at yourself in the mirror like know what you're going to say that's the key for me it's just getting started i own and manage rental properties as soon as that comes out of my mouth i'm good like i'm rolling i just needed to get that out so uh for you <laughs> need more than that, then go for it. And if you're really bold, when you get to the end of it, you could say, is that something you'd be interested in? I can tell you, I've never mm -hmm. asked anybody that before, but I have given them my business card and then they tell me they're interested. Uh, so it just depends on your personality and how bold you want to be. But here's the deal. Real estate is super sexy. Okay. People love real estate. You mentioned real estate. I just about, I don't care who it is. Folks love it. Um, but not a ton of people do it. Like sometimes when you're in this circle, you think everybody does real estate because you know, you're on this call and everybody on here does real estate. That's not true. You could go to a whole group of people and nobody does real estate. Like you're wanting to do it. Just tell everyone what you're doing. Don't worry about it. tell your family what you're doing. Tell your friends what you're doing. The key to raising private money is relationships. It's getting it out there and building that credibility in your business. So just tell everyone. All right, here's some case studies for you guys. And then I want to get to some Q&A because I know we're coming to it here. First one, like I promised, bought this deal. Oh. Left side, we rehabbed it. I say we. See, I'm, I'm saying we now. It was I, and now it's we. But actually, it was all me. I rehabbed <laughs> the left side of this. Beautiful, rented it out. Gosh, the people in the right side just seemed fantastic. So we kept them. The rent was way below market value. The place was a total dump, but we knew that they rented it and it was a dump when they started living there. So we kept them there, used a private lender to fund this deal at 68,000 mm -hmm. and then went to get an appraisal. And those of you that are hearing this already are gasping, I'm sure. The appraisal came in at just enough for me to pay off the lender. I can't remember whatever 85% was at 80,000, came in at 80,000, which was six, gave me 68,000 to pay off my lender. I lost over $20,000 because all my rehab costs stayed in this nice left-handed unit over here, which is beautiful. Uh, not all 20, by the way, we had to do a lot of roof and gutters and foundation work and stuff like that. But either way, I did not get that money back. So if anybody ever says they never lost money in real estate, don't believe them. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> uh, may, maybe it is for some of you, but uh, certainly is not for me. All right, we're going to go through this deal. I'm probably not going to get to the next one, guys, um, unless uh, I'll let you do that. So, okay, the first deal, I can't actually see it. You may lose your person, man or woman. Um, so purchase price on this one was $70,000, all right? Uh, the appraised value ended up being 120,000. The rehab cost was 20, about 27,000. These are round numbers. Okay. 
we know exactly how much the rehab cost, but it was right around 27,000. We got a private lender for this deal uh, for 70K, right? So they, they, they lent on the entire purchase price, which is what I like to do. Uh, I like to have one lender per deal. I don't like to have second, you know, put lenders in second lien positions. It just creates more logistics that I don't have to worry about. Um, and for us, it's simplicity. Like it has to be simple. I don't want huge complex deals. Uh, that's just the way that we structured our business personally. Um, so loan amount 70, the terms were 10% for 18 months. However, that 18 months was just, I could utilize that money for 18 months. All right. It wasn't that I had to pay all 18 months, no matter what I told him, I would guarantee 90 days. That, that, that's just how I structure mine because I'm not going to refinance it in less than 90 days anyway. So it gives them a little bit of assurance that they're going to make some money. I guarantee him 90 days. After that, I can refinance at any point and there's no prepayment penalty, okay? But this, this particular deal, I asked for 18 months and he was fine with that. So we refinanced that and we pulled out $93,000. And if you do the math real quick, you find that those don't quite add up, but I'll explain in a second. Sometimes you just have to take a chance. Uh, I was absolutely sweating bullets on this, guys. I swear to you, I was. We own the quad next door. I took a chance and I cold called this triplex. Now, I know that some of you personalities will talk to anybody on the phone and you're like, cold calling's right in your wheelhouse. I was sweating bullets, but I called them. Literally, she picked up the phone and I said, would you ever consider selling? And she said, yes. Yes, I would love to sell this thing. And then she went on to tell me the story and we would sell it for 70,000. We may even consider less, but you know, and I mean, she was like, that never happens guys. Okay. That's, this is my highlight reel, right? I had to share the bad one first. Um, but we refinanced this not too long ago, actually. So the <laughs> owner, uh, the owner said that someone else was interested. I responded, no problem. I ended up getting, I said, let me just go see the property. I'd love to see it. And he said, Hey, that'd be great. So we set up an appointment. We went to see the property. My private lender on this deal who I lined up ahead of time was actually with me. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend that, but again, this is one of my dear friends, uh, another one. And uh, we'd done five deals together. So he's like, Hey, I'd like to walk through this one. I said, well, come along, let's go. And we'll go out to lunch afterwards. So we did, we walked through this property and walked through it, knew this was a great deal. And he, again, told me, Hey, but I got this other guy already told him about it. I said, Hey, no problem. If it falls through that, he doesn't want it. <laughs> right. This is, this is the hammer right here. I'll pay your asking price and I can close in a week. That's the hammer, right? It doesn't always work guys, but in this one, I had a feeling would. and, uh, he said, well, you know, we, you know, I don't know how interested he really was. <laughs> you know, because suddenly there's money on the table. So, uh, he's ready to close. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, we ended up closing on that deal. The lender was with me. Uh, I guess I have the here. We'd done two deals with him. I, the next one we, yeah. Anyway, I got those mixed up. But anyway, we had only done two deals together at this point. So here's how it ended up. The cost is 27K to rehab all three units, including one eviction. Just have to throw that in there. Uh, side note, get good at dealing with inherited tenants or at getting inherited tenants out of units. If you get good at that, you're going to make a lot of money in this business because there's a lot of investors that don't want to deal with it. <clears throat> we finished the rehab in about six months, but we held the loan until 12 months. Why would we do that? It just costs us more money. The reason I did that was very calculated. I wanted this lender. I had it all rented, all three units rented. It was cash flowing fantastic, even with the loan. I wanted this lender to make as much money as possible. I, I did. I wanted them to feel really happy about investing with me because I knew that we wanted them for, uh, we wanted to invest with him on another deal. So, so the bank gave us 85% LTV appraised value at five and a half percent over 25 years. So 25 year am it appraised for 120 K we took out 93, which is 77% of the LTV. This property has been cash flowing like crazy. It was a wonderful deal. It paid for a large chunk of the rehab that we had already put into it. And we didn't want to destroy our cash flow. So this is one of the teaching points from this property is when you're figuring out and finance. So for example, we always use the banks. I know Chad, for example, uh, he I'm sure has shared a lot of times we'll use other private investors or do long-term deals with private investors. We typically do 12 to 24 months 
and then we refinance it out so we can use that lender on another deal. Um, that's just typically how we structure them. And so on this one, we didn't want to take out any more money than that because we really had a cash flow goal on this property. So when you're working out a deal and you're running your numbers, know what your cash flow is going to be when you have a private lender at whatever percentage you decide on, but also know so that there's no surprises what your cash flow is going to be at refinance. You know, call around, talk to some banks, find out what they're willing to do for investors and know that number because that number is really critical to even knowing what you can offer. Because ultimately, as you guys know, it doesn't matter what the seller says. It's what you can do, what your numbers work for. Uh, so it just gives you a starting point. So we ended up with no money left in this deal after the refinance. And that's always the goal, guys. It doesn't always turn out that way. But if you run your numbers right, most of the time it does. And so that's how we structure our deals. Uh, so we've got 13 minutes here. It's 8.17. Uh, Sham, uh, should we open it up for questions or should I keep going to 8.30? What, what should I do? Well, why don't you go for a, a few more minutes, then we'll open up any questions on the chat? I don't think so. No, we've not so far. Okay. Yeah, give them about okay. five, 10 minutes questions. And then we can wrap it up. Okay, cool. All right, so here's, here's another case study here. So these are two houses on the same parcel, all right? Purchase price of 110,000. We are in Lancaster. Oh, you guys are in Dayton, so you get stuff for cheap too. I've talked to some of you guys. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the Columbus folks that when they see these numbers, they're just like, you bought two houses for 110,000? What? That wouldn't even buy you like a blade of grass in Columbus. So this deal is 110,000. Again, I asked for the full loan amount uh, or the full asking excuse me, the full purchase price of 110,000, 10% again for 12 months. Again, I offered them 90 days guaranteed. I'll pay 90 days interest. And then there's no prepayment penalty after that. Uh, the ARV we figured was around 250,000. Uh, that ended up being higher than we thought, but it still worked out very good. This was a long time friend. This one, the reason I put this on here is we actually went in the contract without the money. So I didn't have the money lined up. It kind of snuck up on me. Uh, I was new to private lending and I, I just didn't have a lot of lenders on, on that. I, I didn't have any actually. And so I thought, well, let's just get this thing under contract and what can I do with this? And this is where it's important to have, if you can have three exit strategies for these properties, it, you'll be able to sleep at night. So that's what I always walk in. I want three exit strategies of what I can do. So in this one, it was private money. It was to partner on the deal. I knew some folks that were willing to partner or I could wholesale it. I knew I had it at a good enough price that other investors would buy this property. So those were my three things. So I knew that if I couldn't raise the money, I could still make money on the deal. The worst feeling in the world is to take something into contract and then not be able to close the deal. Uh, I've never personally had that happen. Um, but it's a hard place to be. So you want to have some exit strategies that you know you can get this deal done for somebody. So call my first option. Um, this was actually a person that I'd met at a meetup. Uh, they were a high income earner. I think he was a surgeon actually. Uh, ended up calling him. He had never lent before and he just wasn't ready yet. Uh, and, and this happened a lot, especially when I got started. Well, I would call the first person or the second person and they just weren't quite ready yet. It could have been my tone of voice. It could have been that, uh, it could have been a lot of different things. They, maybe they genuinely just weren't ready yet, but this person wasn't. I called my second option and he asked when and how long and what I wanted to, what I was willing to pay. All right, we had the relationship already and th that's what was key on this deal. So he ended up talking to his wife and I got the yes the next day. Key point. When you're calling someone trying to, to raise money for a deal, give them a time frame for when to get back to you, especially if you have a property under contract. Uh, this happens. Uh, we've seen this happen a lot, especially with our with our clients is they'll they'll make a phone call and they'll come back and say, hey, I made the phone call and they're going to think about it. And I'm like, awesome. When are they going to when are you going to get back with them? And they're like, well, we didn't set that up, you know. Give them 48 hours. They shouldn't need a whole lot more time. That, hey, and just ask them, hey, is there any way you can let me know like in the next 48 hours because I've got this deal under contract and time is a, kind of of the essence. And if not, I'm going to, you know, call somebody else. It's okay to say that. And 
every time they'll say, oh yeah, absolutely. I can let you know maybe by tomorrow. And so just a little tidbit for you there. Make sure you put a time on it. He was thrilled. It worked out on this deal. If you do the math, it's over $900 a month in passive income. Now, I don't know about you, but I would love to just make $900 worth of passive income just loaning a longtime friend money so that he can do real estate. Like, And it's backed by the real estate itself. So worst case scenario, the lender gets the houses. Like if I don't pay this guy and I default on this, the worst case scenario for him is he gets these houses. So, and he knows they're a good deal. Power of private money, wrapping up here. On this one, we split the parcel. So it's two houses on the same parcel, put all new HVAC, new hot water heaters, all that fun stuff. The roof and gutters were already new. This gal really needed out of this deal. At the 10 month mark, we started the refinance. Another key point is if you know the loan's coming up in month 12, start early, especially now. Um, start early, give yourself plenty of time. You don't wanna stress going out to the last second. Uh, even though a lot of times you can extend it, it's usually not a problem if you need to do that, but it's best not to. You want to maintain as much credibility as you possibly can. So close that thing out on time or just a hair early. The results, the lender was paid back in full. The rehabs were paid for completely. And cash flow also received for those entire 12 months, the property still cash flowed. So we received the, the cash flow of the properties. And on this deal, we could have taken out more. But because of the strategy at the time, we took out $5,000 just extra that we wanted for closings and stuff for some other deals we had coming up. So this again is the goal. Everything was paid for. Imagine how many deals you can do if you have no money wrapped up in them. In the end, you close the deal, you've got a cash flowing property. What are the returns? So sometimes people say, what are the returns that you expect on these deals? And I don't really have a great answer other than infinite. I mean, I, I don't, I don't even know if, if you have no money left in it, then uh, yeah, the returns on that are pretty good. So again, this is our strategy. This is the way that we use private money and we rent, we just rinse and repeat. Uh, and the beautiful thing is you don't need a hundred private lenders to do this. Uh, if you have three to five private lenders, you can do a lot of deals. All right. You can build your business pretty much as big as you can dream it. It just takes some time. It just takes some time and consistency. So anyway, guys, I hope that was an encouragement to you. I hope you learned something most importantly. Uh, and I hope you work on your list soon of potential private lenders. That's your first step, your homework assignment. So anyway, I'm going to hand it over to Chad here. So go ahead, man.